Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Department of Commerce's Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Observance, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we have plenty to cover in this event, so I'm just going to make my remarks a little bit brief. My name is, I always forget to say my name, so I'm going to say it. My name is Cristina Bartolome, or Cristina Bartolome, and I work for the Department of Commerce Office of Civil Rights. Uh, and I'm really happy to MC today and also to serve as a photographer and uh, the as the Deputy Undersecretary <laughs> said, other duties as assigned. So I'll be running around throughout the event. Um, as many of you know, and as you see over here, uh, the month of May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And it is a time to honor, to celebrate the Asian American and Pacific Islanders community in the United States and around the world, and to celebrate the contributions to our economic, academic, cultural, and social institutions. So today's program, hashtag this is my story, I decided to put a hashtag because it always sounds so modern and great, so. Um, and if you do use social media, please use it too, hashtag this is my story, maybe add some DOC right there at the end. Um, so it was coordinated to echo the spirit of this month and a few weeks ago a couple of commerce employees, very dedicated commerce employees, we got together and uh, they met with the Office of Civil Rights and we brainstormed ideas of how we can make uh, this event a little bit more inclusive because often when we do these events we think about the outside. How do we bring the outside in, right? And this time we thought how do we bring the insiders, the in side in, insider, whatever. Um, and what about commerce employees? What about commerce leadership? And so this event was born. Um, it is a storytelling showcase in which we will be giving commerce employees and leaders a platform uh, to share their stories and to connect with you. Um, and for you, our audience, as you can see here, to learn, to engage with one another, and to grow as a person and as a professional. Um, so you're in for a treat. I've actually heard a couple of these presentations already and I was just stunned. So no pressure guys. <laughs> They're right here in the front. Um, yeah, you can tell which ones are going to be the presenters today because they're all looking at their papers and their presentations right now. Uh, uh, you're going to kill it. You're going to be amazing. Um, so before we move on to our first presentation, um, I want to acknowledge the Department of Commerce. Let me make sure that I say this right. HQ. A-A-P-I-E-R-G, that stands for Asian American, no, Headquarters Asian American and Pacific Islander Employee Resource Group. It is the first ever A-A-P-I-E-R-G, general A-A-P-I-E-R-G group at the Department of Commerce. I think it was just officially announced yesterday, so congrats to you. I see Xiaobing Feng in the back, in the back. she's the president. <laughs> So congrats to you, and she has been a, a huge help for us and for this event. And I also want to acknowledge Ms. Erin Liu. She's in the back over there, I see you. Um, she is the founder of the American Asian Pacific Culture Advancement Society. Uh, her dedication to the Asian community and her efforts in ensuring that we have the wonderful tasting menu that we have in the back of this room. And I also want to thank Chef, Master Cook Chefs Andy Junkiao Li and Michael Zhuanhui, I hope I'm pronouncing them right, Zhuanhui Shen, for their efforts in making these delicious sample of Imperial Court desserts. You can only find them here or in Beijing. So make sure that uh, you get, grab a, a little bit of those desserts. So. <laughs> and thank you to our volunteer presenters. I am in awe of your stories, and I can't wait for everybody else to uh, hear them. And with that said, let us begin. Um, I am very, very honored to introduce you to our first guest speaker. Uh, I got a chance to sit one-on-one uh, -on -one with her yesterday, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, she is the Deputy Undersecretary for International Trade, Sarah Kemp. I called her Miss Kemp, she's like, just call me Sarah. So Sarah. <laughs> Uh, she currently oversees the daily operations of the International Trade Administration. I see a couple of ITA folks over here. Um, and uh, yeah, so ITA has an annual budget of $483 million, and probably more right now, with approximately 2,100 trade and investment professionals based on more than 100 US cities and 70 markets around the world. She is a dedicated public servant with vast professional experience in working with Asian countries, promoting US exports, US trade promotion, trade policy, and more. 
She has, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that she has lived in Hong Kong, Beijing, Vietnam, and uh, other Asian cities across the world. Um, but I'll let her speak more about this uh, herself. So please give a warm welcome to stage Deputy Undersecretary Sarah Kemp. I'll do it. Yeah, you can do it. I'll let you do it quick. So first and foremost, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. It's an important event, and I want to thank Christine. I want to thank our presenters. I can't wait to hear your stories. But I also want to thank each one of you. Um, when Xiaoping approached me and said, hey, um, would you be willing to do this? Of course I said yes. And then I went, oh, what am I going to talk about? And I want to thank Xiaoping for being sort of the spark for this and, and really encouraging me to come up and share my story. I am humbled uh, by the opportunity. Uh, if you know me, you know that I want this to be interactive. So I hope you all have had your coffee or caffeine or whatever gets you jazzed in the morning. Uh, and so as opposed to sitting here and telling you, you know, how did I come on this Asian tour of my career, I thought I'd cut to the chase. So click, where's the clicker? Oh, clicker, right? Okay, so how did I end up on what I call my Asian odyssey? It started with the junior year. You can read through some of the highlights of what brought me to a 27-year career focused on Asia here at the Department of Commerce. And I have been extraordinarily grateful uh, for the opportunities that I have been able to pursue here at Commerce. Um, I started with a junior year in Hong Kong. I worked in a Vietnamese refugee camp in Hong Kong. I worked at the Center for Chinese Legal Studies at Columbia, joined Commerce, and then started with working on ASEAN policy uh, for four years at headquarters before I went to Beijing and then did Beijing, Hong Kong, Beijing, Vietnam, Beijing. But there's a whole other side of me than this professional, I've done all these assignments overseas. So what might not be obvious to you when you look at me is that when I go to school events, I'm known as Mrs. Hong, right? Um, I also, overseas, when I show up at events, they would often say, oh, because I was in Asia, what does your husband do? And I would say, well, he very nicely helps me take care of my kids because the assumption was that I was the stay-at-home expat wife. Um, and finally, my children don't necessarily look like me, although I think they do, and are often thought of as not mine. I've had many people come up and say, oh, whose children are these? And they say, they're mine. Are they disturbing you? Um, they're often too Western for China, and they've grown up in China until they came back three years ago to the States. They've totally grown up in China, and, and Hong Kong, and Vietnam, Asia. And often, they're too Asian for the US. My son, in his high school, is known as the Asian kid, which to me, I'm like, really? Because I see you as so mixed. Um, but on that, Want to click? Yeah. Yeah. So um, here's here, the, here they are, just in case you're curious. And just to for all of you who have teenagers, you might appreciate this. Let's see. Go ahead. Click. Oh, oh, where's the audio? Where's the audio? Where's the audio, Matt? We need your help. The audio you want to hear because yeah. I get so much respect at home. I know. <laughs> Seriously. Let's see. It's on. Matt, we need your help. Let's see. Is this connected? <laughs> there it is. They're going to kill me that I did this. <laughs> really? I did not tell them. I saw this already. No, not going to work. Oh, oh no. I'm not sure. Okay, so I'll set the scene. This is bowling at the White House. How cool is that? <laughs> Except my children. No, but they have a very funny way of, um, if you ever hear it, for the weather. For the WebEx, they have a very funny way of um, trying to imitate me and make me feel just, you know, so proud. But anyway, I just put that up there as a way of trying to make it a little more personal. 
So that's me, and I really wanted this to be interactive. So I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to take uh, anything you want to throw at me in terms of professional, personal questions that you might have. But I thought I would put this sort of professional, personal mix up there just to try to raise the questions and to get people to think that what you see is not always what is there. And you know, we are all onions that with layers to peel back or the don't judge a book by its cover. Um, I have loved in my life that I have shown up and been not what was expected in many different ways. Um, I have embraced the Asian culture and feel privileged to be able to share in it with my husband and my family. Um, and I just, again, want to thank you all for showing up. But any questions, anyone? Oh, come on, don't be shy. Yes. That's a great question. So my kids are third country kids. And my daughter, uh, when she went to choose colleges, made it really easy. Anything in Manhattan. <laughs> Seriously, that was her entire college tour was Manhattan. Um, because she felt she wanted a cosmopolitan uh, big city, because she had only lived in big cities, and she wanted to be able to blend. Um, my son came back for ninth grade, right? Bring him back for high school. And I have to say, he has become very American, <laughs> very American, um, in a way that I did not totally expect. Um, but he has really embraced sort of being a teenager and a high schooler all at once. So very different uh, approaches. But they, they interestingly enough, um, so my daughter, when she was born, she was born in Thailand. She, until she was 11, thought she was Thai. So when you said, what are you? She said, oh, I'm Thai. I'm like, actually an American passport. You know, they grow up when they were 14 and uh, 9, and they, we came back for July 4th, and they couldn't uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. They didn't know the national anthem. I was like, oh my god, I, I got to do something, right? So I, of course, as a good um, almost Asian mother, as I'm sometimes, uh, sometimes they claim that I am, put them in uh, American history school, right? Because I'm like, oh my god, you have got to learn something. You're the kid of an American diplomat and you don't know the Pledge of Allegiance? So, you know, they went through every Wednesday from, you know, four to six. They learned American history and the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm happy to say. Um, but yeah, they've definitely been a third country kid. Other questions? Yes? Any funny reverse culture shock stories? Oh, yeah. Yes. So, cars stop for you. You know, so I, you know, specific, uh, particularly coming back from, I would say, Vietnam more so than China, was crossing the street. It was like this nirvana, like, wow, I put my toe up, look, they stop. The cars are stopping. And um, I, I did that kind of jokingly, and then my son actually picked it up. I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to actually really deliberately cross. But, but part of it was uh, just sort of the traffic flow was one of the big things when we came back. And I will say that I never, 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 take for granted what you have outside. The fact that I can't see, I can't taste, I can't smell the air. You know, we used to joke in Beijing, like, if you can't see, taste, or smell it, how do you know it's there? You guys take a leap of faith every day because there's air out there and it's, you're going to be able to breathe, right? So that, that was another thing in terms of coming back. I'm like, wow, you guys, this is so awesome. Do you know that? Um, so that would be the other thing. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> I had this really intense discussion with my, no. Uh, what happened was it was really like a 30-second conversation with myself. I, in high school, had the opportunity to go to France and Scotland on exchanges. And I went something like this, huh, I want to get away from Hamilton, which if anyone knows Hamilton College in upstate New York, it's in the middle of nowhere and there's probably more cows than people. So I thought, huh, I really want to get away. I've been to Europe, so that's kind of old school. I need to do Asia, that's kind of new school. I think, I think more people in Japan speak English than in China, so I should learn Chinese. That was the entire extent of my conversation, <laughs> right? And then, so Hamilton didn't have a Chinese language program, so I listened to tapes. Anyone know what a tape is in this room? <laughs> they had to fly a professor from, Colum from uh, Cornell in to test me at the end of the semester. I just listened to tapes, that's all I did. <laughs> um, and then I made, the decision to go to China, right? 
All of you who are experts in Asia are gonna laugh at this. So where did I go? Hong Kong. <laughs> right? And I got off and went, this is in China? And it wasn't, but it was a really great experience and it kind of launched me uh, on my path to really focus on Asia uh, for a career. So yeah, yes. Okay, so my son loves Indian. Um, that's his favorite. Uh, so I cook Western. My husband cooks better than I do everything, but he does all the Asian cooking um, because I just, I just didn't want that sort of stress of like, yeah, it's not like your mom, I know. Um, but I do all the Western cooking except for the steaks, uh, and he does all the Asian cooking. So that's how that breaks down. But again, my son loves Indian, which I can't cook, so. We order out. One more question. Yes. You made some humorous remarks about uh, not being Chinese in China and not being American in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, when you travel as a family mm -hmm. in the haunts in the States, such as at Disneyland or Disney World, uh -huh. um, do you see any reaction that is other than you're not there? Uh, I haven't been to Disney World, so. Oh, well, <laughs> any other major yeah, gathering okay. place yeah. outside of the travel Um, we haven't. I'll be very honest. We've had a very, I mean, um, I haven't had an experience. I will tell you, the only experience uh, that comes to mind was in nine, <clears throat> a long time ago, when my husband and I were first in DC, a very, 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 very long dinosaurs, in dinosaurs ages, as my son likes to remind me, um, he and I, you know, on a Friday night, we'd go to a bar or a restaurant, and I remember being at a bar once, and the, okay, I looked very young, so I'm gonna give it a, the um, bartender said, oh, is this your exchange student? And I was like, kinda. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, that, that's the only thing that comes to mind. But otherwise, we've had a very... Good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, with that, I just want to say, again, thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you for your contributions. Um, it's important, and I appreciate what you do each and every day. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the stories of everyone else. So thank you for participating. Thank you so much, Sarah. I got the money shot right now, by the way. I got a perfect picture of you. I'm going to send it to you. It looks amazing. Uh, thank you for your Q&A, your remarks. I think it, um, I believe when we, when we first spoke, uh, we talked about uh, how diversity and inclusion is just so encompassing, right? And it's interesting that from an outsider, they would look at you and you would seem a certain way and they wouldn't know the depth of your experience and your connection to a different culture that people wouldn't perceive, right? And you know that's, that's what we like to do here at the Commerce Civil Rights Office. We like to defy um, expectations and upturn biases and you know, make sure that folks are included. So thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, another round of applause, please. All right, you guys ready? <laughs> Fun part. All right, so now it's time to do, introduce you to the other stars of today's event. So these individuals will each join the stage and they will have about a five minute presentation each, a little bit of a TED Talk-like uh, presentation. Um, it's not easy, but these guys have managed to just do these brief presentations. So if we time this right, you will have an opportunity to ask them questions after everybody is done. So let's start with Lisa, Dr. Lisa Eng. Uh, she is a mechanical engineer in the engineering laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, and has been there uh, over eight years conducting on building-related research, including airflow and indoor air quality performance in buildings. That's very impressive. Uh, welcome, Dr. Eng.
Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Sarah, thank you for giving your remarks. Christina, thank you for the introduction. I really enjoyed the last bullet on your slide where you said your children weren't American enough for the US, but not Chinese enough for, the, for China. And I think my story kind of echoes that. So my name is now Lisa, but that wasn't the name that I was given. At home, growing up, my parents called me Xiaohua, which literally means little Chinese. So in, at home, it was Xiaohua, do your homework. And at school, it was Lisa, where's your homework? At home, I ate rice. At school, I ate pizza. At home, I spoke Chinglish, which is a mixture of Chinese and English. And at school, I spoke, well, actually, I didn't speak very much because I was actually quite shy. <laughs> but I was living a double life, and I didn't even know it. But I was neither embarrassed by my Americanness in front of my Chinese family or ashamed of my Chinese-ness in front of my American friends. I lived in two worlds, and I slipped each into each and out of them seamlessly. And growing up in Philadelphia made this very easy. I always grew up in diverse communities and went to diverse schools. So I had American friends, I had Chinese friends, we went to the mall, and we went to dim sum. And I never felt out of place as a child. I didn't even feel out of place when I went to an engineering college and was the only female in an engineering classroom. Not even then. So can you guess where it was that I finally felt out of place? Washington, it, <laughs> Washington DC. <laughs> Close. It was actually in Taiwan where my mother was born and where I moved to after college to take a job after college. And it was surprising because I look like people there. I have black hair, I have dark brown eyes, I have olive skin. And if I mumble enough, my Mandarin can pass as a native for just a few seconds. But I had never felt so out of place as I did there. One time, I walked into a clothing store, just didn't say a word, just doing my browsing business, and the saleswoman said to me, you're not from around here, are you? I mean, what, I, did I have a sign on my back? I was wearing all clothes I had bought in Taiwan. Granted, they were from The Gap, <laughs> but the styles are different. And that's when I realized that my Americanness was showing through even if I looked like them, even if I dressed like them. So I began a very cliche post-college journey to find myself in Taiwan. And I was there for two years, and I learned a lot about myself. I learned about what it was to be a professional in the working world. I learned about myself personally. And I learned a lot about what it really means to be an American, but in Taiwan. So three things I learned. One. I'm sarcastic, and I never really realized that I was. It's not like sarcasm runs deep in our culture or anything, but it's a very American thing to be sarcastic. And speaking to Taiwanese, they didn't get my jokes. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, I learned that I'm growing up in America, I've learned to be very independent. So when I first got to Taiwan, everyone was very concerned about my well-being. They wanted to make sure if I knew which bus to ride, which bus stop to get on, which bus stop to get off, if I would eat dinner, because you know my manner was so awesome. <laughs> they were afraid I might starve. And at first it was intrusive, like, uh, why are you in my business? But that's just how they are. They're very caring. They care about everyone, even coworkers as family. And the last thing I learned was that I'm proud to be an American. And maybe it was the way I was carrying myself in that store that kind of set me apart. And why am I proud to be American? Because we get to live in a melting pot. We get to live in the land of opportunities. And these are values that our country were built on. And we still have a long ways to go, but I'm proud that a lot of us have the vision to get there. So, I guess I'm American, all right, mystery solved.
I got on a plane, craving a cheeseburger the entire 14-hour flight. And lo and behold, it was not as easy as that. I got off the airplane, and suddenly I was self-conscious, not just of my Taiwanese clothes, but just how Chinese I looked compared to everyone else. And I didn't know what to make of these feelings because I had grown up in the U.S. for close to 20 years, and I never fell out of place. So why now? Why didn't I have these feelings earlier? But maybe it was okay that I didn't have these feelings earlier. So I went on round B of my journey of self-discovery, and I learned that I don't have to pick my Americanness or my Asianness. I can embrace both. So what I embrace about my America, uh, about my Asianness is one that uh, we care for one another, even if we've just met. And I don't have to be so standoffish, as not all Americans are, but we can be that way. And another thing I learned from my parents that I like to carry on is to respect my elders, to put my family first. And there's nothing wrong with that. I remind my children every day to respect their elders, <laughs> me. And I like my Americanness too. I think my sarcasm has increased since I returned from Taiwan, and that's okay. It binds us together. <laughs> And lastly, I like being independent. I like figuring things out my own, and that's okay too. And I'm really proud to be part of this event today, to get to hear the stories from all of our, uh, our, our colleagues at Commerce, and that we're freely able to do this in America, and I'm proud of that. So I've learned to live in both worlds. Actually, I think I'm taking a little bit of this world and a little bit of that world, and making the best of both worlds. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was wonderful. See, guys? I told you. All right. We'll go ahead now. I'm going to present Pauline Trong. She's also from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. She's a conference coordinator at the Office of Public Affairs. Welcome, Pauline. Hi, guys. Awesome. I was waiting for Lisa's presentation for like the longest time, so that was very, very empowering, Lisa. Thank you. All right, so my name is Pauline Trong, and I'm a conference coordinator, like Christina said, and this is my story. All right. So when I was little, I like tried so hard to fit in, not with just my peers, with my family. Um, there were a lot of things that was expected of me and asked from me that I would do because I respect my elders, but I never understood it. I couldn't relate to it. Um, my favorite story I still tell, and I, I tell my grandma this all the time, it, really, it, it's, it has to do with her, um, and she denies it. So I was like 9 or 10, and it's Sunday night, it's family gathering, everyone's at, gra at, my, at grandma and grandpa's house. I'm playing outside in the living room. My grandma calls me in from the kitchen and she goes, I go in and she goes, Pauline, it's time you learn to do the dishes. Your mom and your auntie, they cook dinner for everyone, like you gotta do your part. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. So I'm doing it and I'm doing it as like a nine or 10 year old. So you're hearing clank, clunk, like, you know, I'm not used to holding delicate porcelain bowls. And um, from the side, I hear my grandma and I still, I can see her and she goes, <sighs> how are you going to feed your husband and take care of your family if you wash dishes like that? <laughs> and I'm thinking, seriously? This is what dictates my life? How I wash dishes? So uh, growing up, it was, it was a bunch of those type of stories where I just kind of just was going with the flow and doing it horribly, um, just trying to please my parents and my grandma. And I kind of did this and felt kind of lost and lonely. Um, up until Mulan happened. <laughs> you guys have seen Mulan, right? Because my, my examples are gonna be like spoilers. <laughs> okay, so I watched Mulan when I was like probably 10, 11. So it was like two, three years after this movie came out. And it was, she changed my life. She gave me meaning. I could relate to someone. I could do a thing where if I get stuck, I would be like, what would Mulan do? Um, and um, 
I have, have three pictures or in a, in a jiffy that kind of worked, yay, um, of my favorite scenes of, of the movie. So one of them was when she, she's like crying and she's sad and she's sitting on the great stone dragon and she's thinking like, man, I really disappointed my family because she spoke up um, in front of the town people because her dad got called to go to the army to defeat the Huns. And she's like, no, don't do it. My dad, my dad has served his time. And she got shunned for it. She got, you know, so she's sitting on the great stone dragon. She's sad and you don't know if it's tears or that she's crying or if it's the rain. And that's when she decides like, you know what? I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna follow my heart. I'm gonna do what's right. So the scene of her cutting her hair with a sword, like, like a total rock star, that's inspiring to me. Like, it's, it's awesome. So I kind of followed this, like what would Mulan do for like a long, long time, like 10, 15 years. Okay, you talk to my friends and stuff, they're like, yeah, Pauline's Mulan. Like, it's crazy. And I kept doing that until Ali Wong showed up. Okay, do you guys know who Ali Wong is? She is obnoxious and raw, but authentic and real. I stumbled on Ali Wong's, um, her stand-up like stand special on Netflix. I was just flick, 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 flipping through, and I'm like, what is this Asian girl with awesome glasses, and you know, what is she gonna do? So I watched it, and my mom came in halfway through, and I'm like, oh crap, she's gonna say something. And she did, she's like, she's foul, I don't like her, but she's, my mom sat through the whole thing with me. Um, <laughs> You know, so I'm like, okay, so I think you do like her. I think you like how awesome and original she is. So Ali Wong um, makes me feel human. So last night I was doing like a, a dry run with my sister and we were talking about Ali Wong. We always talk about Ali Wong. And she, we got on the topic of ba a bad Asian. And she's like, do you remember during that stand up when Ali Wong was going, yeah, um, her mom was a uh, discouraging her because I guess during her stand-up shows she'll show her panties or something and her mom's like that's so bad of you you're a bad Asian she's like I'm the bad Asian like your daughter your other daughter's a lesbian <laughs> so Ali Huang is great she like you know she makes me feel proud to be an Asian American like you know there's more sides to of us than you know what's stereotyped so shortly after Ali Wong, I started noticing this snowball effect of uh, Asian representation in the media. You know, you got the Marie Kondo's Life Changing Magic, the Spark Joy, you know. If it doesn't spark joy, guys, toss it out, okay? And then, you know, Miss Philippine crowned Miss Universe last year. All these crazy things. Fresh off the boat, it's a show. Um, and then the crazy rich Asian film phenomenon and book trilogies, right? Like, it's, it's such a great, it makes me feel proud or being represented um, more than just finding kung fu or, um, I don't know, owning a laundromat. So my favorite, um, my favorite, I guess my proudest moment of this, like realizing like, oh my God, there's more Asians in the media and more stuff for us to, you know, go to was when I went to go see Crazy Rich Asians and I went with my friend and her son, his name is Luca, he's 13. And he goes, we're getting popcorn, and he goes, Miss Pauline, I'm so excited. I think after watching this movie, I'm gonna know you a bit more. And I'm thinking, it's just a movie. Like, okay. So I watched the movie, and I, I kid you not, throughout the whole movie, I was taking notes, like, talk to Luca about this, talk to Luca about that. Like, I wanted him to know, and I was happy that I can tell him, and also he got to see it on the big screen of how I live and how I was raised. So, I guess I wanted to do a talk because I feel so proud. I think it's like such a great time to be an Asian American right now. You know, like I mentioned Mulan and how she popped up like when I was 10 or 11 and then I had, and I had her as my idol for like 15 years until Ali Wong came up. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to search or wait for the next big thing. It's being brought to us and not just to us, to our families and family and friends. It's very enlightening. Um, so, sorry, I'm trying to go off of my notes. Um, so, yes, I just, I guess the, the, the gap, we're bridging the gap of us and them, and it's, it's very, very exciting, and I'm so grateful to be part of it and see it, like, in the works. So I'm going to end this story, um, my presentation with the story of uh, the one person who never really gave up on me. Um, I was just, just a pain in her butt 
Like, I just challenge everything. Uh, she told me, she wanted me to stay close after I graduated. I went super far. Um, she told me, she, I asked, she asked me when I was little what I wanted to do, and I said I want to help people, and that nearly gave her a heart attack because I was not comfortable enough as a job. Um, I work for the government, Mom. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, but my fondest memory of my mom is of her sweeping the house every morning at 7 o'clock, like every morning, it was like, it was like clockwork. And she's not little stitious, she's like superstitious. So she starts from the back of the house and she sweeps with her feathery broom. You guys know what I'm talking about? And as she makes her way towards the front, she wakes us up, you know, either for school or if it's Saturday, we get to watch cartoons. But um, so she's waking us up and I remember thinking like, why is she doing this? Is this, is this expected of me? Because I don't want to do this. Um, so I, I, I always like question her, like, man, like my mom, this is a hard life. I, I kind of don't want to do this, I'm not, not sign up for it. And you know, 20 plus years later, I, I have my own place and I'm cleaning, and then I find myself doing exactly what my mother is doing. Sweep from the back of the house towards the front, shooing, you know, like all the, all the the trash is towards the front of the door and I'm shooing away the bad stuff and welcoming the good juju, right? Um, so I, I'm doing that and, I, and it's funny, I'm proud when I do it. And I'm like, why, why am I proud sweeping my house? And I guess for once I, I felt like really close to my mom and close to my culture and my family and being Asian and American at the same time. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Pauline. That was fantastic. Yeah, Marie kondo in my closet. It's just a disaster right now. I need to get rid of so many things. All right, so next up, we have San Lam. Uh, he's a management analyst at the Economic Development Agency. Welcome, San. Hi, my name is San. People always, always ask me, hey, where are you from? And I'm always like, I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> like, no, where are you from? I'm like, Piscataway, New Jersey? I said, where are you from? What do you want, my home address? <laughs> I once met someone who said that ancestors came, from, came to America on, on the Mayflower. I was like, wow, we're the same. Your family came to America on a boat? My family came to America on a boat. Your family ran away from oppression? My family ran away from oppression. But actually, this is a, a picture of my, my friend. He got rescued out of the South China Sea from the USS Ranger. 138 lives were rescued. Unfortunately, 137 lives were survived. I came to America on a 747. <laughs> on Pan Am, probably, most likely, too. That's because my mom worked for the CIA in, in Saigon. So when I say, I'm going to tell my mom, you better be scared. <laughs> so she was the OG tiger mom before there were tiger moms. I remember sitting in a parent-teacher conference, and she would say, if he's bad, you hit him. I said, what? If he's good, you hit him. It's like, what? That's a, that's a, she grew up in a Catholic school, so, oh, good morning, Sister Kate. <laughs> good morning, yes. So we came to America on 747. We arrived at Camp Pendleton. That's a Marine Corps base in Southern California. And then they said, hey, who wants to go to New Jersey? All the Vietnamese who were smart said, oh, no, San Diego. It's nice and warm. We stay here. But now my parents, where's New Jersey? It's over there. OK, where we go. We go to New Jersey, where it's nice and cold. Oh, we love the Four Seasons. Well, I'm shoveling 100 foot so out of, uh, out of the driveway. So we were, ended up being the only Vietnamese family in Piscataway, New Jersey. Then we discovered there was another Vietnamese family, and then we were the two, uh, one of two Vietnamese families in Piscataway, New Jersey. It was kind of weird because they had, our family was one boy and two girls, and their family was one boy and two girls. And there was a lot of other coincidence, but that's a, another whole other story. And I remember friends during Thanksgiving would say, Oh, we had turkey for Thanksgiving, and it was awesome. It was juicy. We had a pumpkin pie and yams and all this stuff. What did you have? I was like, hmm, I actually had pho. <laughs> but if I said that, they'll be like, what the pho is that? <laughs> so I'm like, 
Uh, yeah, of course I had turkey. It was awesome. I had turkey and yam and all that stuff too. And then on Sunday, there's like, oh, because everybody's in, uh, Italian in New Jersey. On Sunday, they had pasta from scratch. My mom made pasta from scratch. Isn't that the best? Does your mom make pasta from scratch? I'm like, pasta from scratch? What the heck is that? We still had pho on Sunday. <laughs> Now I grew up, you know, they have Food Channel, and you can see what pasta from scratch really was and how hard it is. I'm like, your mom didn't make pasta from scratch. <laughs> Not after making turkey on Thursday and making pasta on Sunday. No way. You didn't make no pasta from scratch. This is what your pasta from scratch was. Did you hear that jar, that lid opening from that jar of ragu? That means it's from scratch. <laughs> but in New Jersey, there was only one Asian grocery store where I grew up, and it was an hour away. So if you wanted something, uh, making pho was actually, we, it was really from scratch. Because if you go to the AMP, that, that's the grocery store where I grew up, they didn't have things like bone beef or oxtail. You go there, hey, where's the, bo uh, where's the uh, oxtail? Oxtail? Get out of here, there's no oxtail. They didn't have sriracha sauce. You can get all that stuff at the Harris Teeter now, but back then, there was no H-Smart or Super Mercado in every corner. So I remember growing up, it, they would make pho. It would take days, and you could smell it, and you'd be hungry all the time. <laughs> but it was good eating, because after it was done, it was like you would eat pho for a whole week because they made it in a big bowl. <laughs> so that's my short presentation, and thank you. <laughs> oh. If my friends can make pasta from opening a can of ragu, I can make pho from scratch as well. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you, Son, so much. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was funny. Okay, next up we have Jawad Ziedin. He works for the Office of Civil Rights. He is a uh, senior data analyst. He has over 14 years of service in the U.S. federal government. He's also a veteran of the U.S. Navy where he served for 60 years. I could read more, but I'm gonna let you uh, tell your story. Welcome, Jawad. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jawad Ziedin. Um, and at one point, I was a high school dropout. What? <laughs> um, I was born and raised in Karachi, Pakistan. Karachi is one of the largest cities in the world with an estimated population of 17 million people. Um, I grew up in one of the most violent areas of Karachi called Golimar. Um, and if I tell you the meaning of Golimar, you're like, well, that's ironic. Because Golimar literally means, Goli is bullet, and Mar means fire. So. Bigger. Um, we also used to have like power outages uh, pretty much every day in summertime. Um, for water, we used to have like a water tanker and a tube well uh, because we didn't get the you know the the fresh water, clean water you get here. Um, also, like we would have shortage of food supplies and gasoline. So this is what what I'm trying to say is I grew up in a hard place. Um, growing up, like uh, many other Pakistanis, I wanted to be a medical doctor, uh, like most of my cousins are. Um, in the mid-90s, uh, my father lost his job in, the, in, in Karachi, so he decided to move back to the U.S. He came to U.S. in the 1970s. He got his master's in pharmacy, got married, had my older brother and sisters born here, and then he decided to move back to Pakistan to take care of his uh, older parents. And it's very common in Asian culture uh, for children to take care of their uh, older parents. Um, and that's one of the values I admire in Pakistani culture, the, the joint family system. And uh, I also want to take care of my parents uh, when my father retires. I mean, why not? We'll have a reliable, uh, trustworthy babysitter. I can enjoy my mom's cooking. And also, I can claim my parents on, as dependent on my taxes. So. <laughs> um, other cultural values and qualities instilled in me are stereotypical Asian um, hard work, 
we all heard about 996 uh, work policy in China, work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Uh, that's similar thing in Pakistan. Um, my dad used to come home like around, right before dinner, he would eat dinner, go to sleep, <laughs> pretty much every day. Um, also staying humble and not complaining. And these are the part of immigrant mentality, um, you know, which, which I attribute my success to. Saying yes to opportunities and, you know, success will come. I feel very lucky to be in the United States because here hard work pays off. Uh, with great determination, consistency towards a particular goal, you'll attain success. So if you're wondering how, how did I, a uh, high school dropout, um, has currently has two master's degrees, currently enrolled in a doctorate program, has six professional certificates. Well, I came to the U.S. when I was 13, and I struggled with, uh, with, uh, in school because of language barrier, um, change in culture, and a different educational system. Uh, after I dropped out of high school, I joined the U.S. Navy. Um, after completing my initial training, I started um, attending college classes uh, after, after work um, and um, eventually um, I accumulated enough uh, semester hours to get enrolled into the undergraduate program that didn't check my high school diploma. So. <laughs> I took, um, during the military, I had to put my education on hold. In 2005, I deployed to Iraq. But even there, I continued with my studies. I studied for my uh, advancement. I got uh, promoted to NCO. And also, um, I studied for the warfare um, specialist device. That's a medal you wear. Um, but after I came back, I uh, enrolled back into college classes. I, I was working from 7 to 4.30, I'll get off work, eat dinner, and then go to school, um, attend classes from 7 to 9 p.m. every day. So that was my life on weekdays, on, and on week, weekends, I would take classes from 8.30 to 4 o'clock. And because of that hard work, working full time, attending classes, I was able to attain uh, my bachelor's degree in uh, with honors in two and a half years. After, um, after I separated from the military, I uh, used my GI Bill, um, got into an MBA program once I finished that, and then I pursued my second master's in uh, information technology because I'm, you know, of my Asian, I have to get into <laughs> IT. Um, um, what I wanted to basically mention here was when you say yes to opportunities, it opens door for other opportunities and brings you success. About a year and a half ago, our office uh, formulated uh, SEPM, Special Emphasis Program um, Committee, and uh, that's where I met Zhao Bing, and uh, with Zhao Bing and Laura, we started the API group, and uh, last year we organized a very successful event had the similar attendance, and this year, we, you know, the, the attendance you see here. Uh, but with that, with saying yes to that group, I um, lear learned about Agen program. Uh, I didn't know about Agen before, and uh, recently, long story short, I got accepted into Agen's SES CDP program. Uh, and again, it's because I say yes to that opportunity, met some people who introduced me to Ajin, I applied and got accepted. So that's my story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Awad. Now we've heard about representation matters, like saying yes to opportunities, and even being given opportunities matters. So um, I'll sum this up when we're done, but I'm just so in awe of all of you who have presented already. And now, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, our last presenter of the day, her name is Sushira Pandey. Uh, she's a PhD. She works as a patent business analyst at the Office of Patent Information at USPTO. And uh, just FYI, she told me to say this, she aspires to be a senior executive service member. So just <laughs> FYI. Namaste. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you. 
My name is Suchira. It's a name that was coined by my father. It's composed of two words, Shuchi and Ra. Shuchi is a Sanskrit word which means purity. Ra means to bring. So my name is one who brings purity. I was born in Mathura. Some of you may know it's the same town where 5,000 years ago Krishna was born. We share some similarities in our life paths. Both of us were born in Mathura. Krishna grew up in Gokul, another town on banks of river Yamuna, went to the western part of the country and formed a new city, Dwaraka, and settled there. Well, I was born in Mathura, and then I grew up in New Delhi, another city on the banks of river Yamuna. And then I traveled all the way west, and here I am in east coast of United States. So how did I get here from New Delhi? It all started with a life-changing moment. I was a teenager, hot summer month. We are in the terrace of our prefabricated apartment building. And my father asked me, Suchira, what are you doing to prepare for your upcoming exam? Pitaji, that's the word we use in Hindi for your father. I asked my mother for six rupees. I wanted to buy a manual which I could use to practice for this upcoming exam. She didn't have six rupees to spare for a manual which would be used just for one month. And I understand. You really want to study and prepare for that exam? Yes, Father, I do. All right, then. Here, take six rupees. Go get yourself the manual and prepare. To put it in perspective, that six rupees at that time was a whole lot of money for our family. In terms of the equivalent, it was 15 cents. But for a family where my father was the only breadwinner, he worked, he was also a civil servant, worked for Information and Broadcasting Ministry in New Delhi. We had eight members of family in our home. Four children, two parents, my paternal grandmother, and her older sister who was a child widow. And we did not have money to spend on luxuries, such as books which were going to be used only for one month. Means we always got our regular textbooks, we never bought them, from the people who were in the senior class. You already talked to them when the school year is done, can I have your books? And the value of that six rupees, 15 cents, is that we had a school trip to go and see Taj Mahal in Agra, one of the eight wonders of the world. The cost was two rupees, five cents. And I was told, we don't have two rupees to spend on just going and seeing a tomb of a dead queen. So I was really touched that I was given this opportunity. I practiced, believe me, I practiced that ex the workbook from front to back many times over, aced the written exam, aced the interview, and got National Science Talent Scholarship. This single 
even that happened, opened the door into the world of science for me. Not only did I complete my bachelor's in botany honors, went on to do a master's in cytogenetics, but more importantly, it allowed me the freedom and the power to travel as a single teenage girl within the country because NCRT was supporting the summer school where I could go, stay for one month in the university hostel, work with the graduate students on a research project while I was still an undergraduate. And not only that, I got an opportunity to then write up a paper, present my own findings in actually a scientific congress in Indian Institute of Technology. And this was like, Wow, I could see I would not have been allowed to go as a single young female to any of these places if it were not for this opportunity, which obviously everybody in the family recognized was something really great. So science has been my ticket and passport for travel in the country and then I aspired to do PhD in molecular genetics, a discipline that was not available in India at that time. Well, I wanted to do that, so I applied to three continents. Now this is where, you know, you never know, because I can only do my part, but rest what the universe is going to do. So I don't want to waste time. Apply to three continents, get accepted, and then decide the school that's giving you money from day one because I had learned I was not going to be putting any more burden on anybody if I had any say in the matter. Come to University of Alberta in Canada, do a PhD. I came to US as a postdoc in Yale University. And I realized the opportunities in terms of research, R&D that is there in this country is amazing. And to top it all, my professors from the master's program, when I was looking for jobs as a postdoc, they told me, look, we've trained you, now go use that training. And I said, but I'm looking for jobs here. They said, right now, we don't want you to come back to India. I said, why so? I said, because right now, you will come back and either you'll be constantly fighting with your supervisors or you'll say, well, I don't get full credit, so I'm not going to do any work. We've trained you well, you have the potential, go use it. Go wherever in the world, and get a job, but you're not getting, you're not coming back here. Not that we don't have the jobs for you, but we want you to build on what we've given you. And that was the journey that took me to work in a biotech company in France. And then as a visiting professor, I came to NIH, and that's when I decided, okay, I want to stay here because I had experience being that interesting foreigner in France. So it's like, no, I cannot see myself staying here for the rest of my life. Having done everything on my own, this was not something unusual. I decided to apply for my own green card as an exceptional scientist. And then once I got naturalized, coming from a family of public servants, I wanted to come back and work for the federal government. Started as a contractor in NOAA, and then got the opportunity to work at USPTO, which is where I'm still there. So if it was not for that investment, 
And it's not just the money investment, the opportunity, the belief, and the trust that was given to me as a teenage girl by my father, I would not be standing before you today. I see there is a big push right now for encouraging girls to go into the field of science. And I stand here before you to this commerce community. I would like to be the ambassador for our department to give aspirations, hopes, and direction to these young women to believe in themselves and to know that here, if they believe in themselves and in the and they truly believe in the motto of the country, in God we trust, they can achieve whatever they want and carve out a destiny for themselves that will be their unique trail. Thank you. Wow. Say, Sierra, uh, thank you so much. I know we're out of time, but please stay on stage, Sushira. Uh, stay on the stage, and I'm gonna ask the rest of the presenters to please come on stage as well. We really wanna thank you for uh, the time and effort that you spend on these presentations. And I've heard a lot, you know, you, you finish your presentation, Sushira, with opportunity, belief, trust, support. Uh, so many key words, right? And um, thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A, but we will be mingling please, uh, if you guys want to ask them any questions. And in the back, I really want to make sure that everybody knows that the American Asian Pacific Advancement Society has uh, imperial Chinese desserts, and you will, will not be able to find them anywhere in the world, well, anywhere in the United States. Uh, but here and in Beijing, uh, these are, they come from the Ch Qing Dynasty in China, and they are favorites of the emperor and empress of China. Please go in the back, talk to Aaron, talk to Michael, talk to Andy, the, ch the chefs, and please grab a couple of those. So thank you so much. Please give them a round of applause. We have a couple of... All right, and because I'm the photographer, I'm gonna step down now and take pictures. Uh, Deputy Undersecretary, Sarah, please, you can join us. Uh, and enjoy the desserts in the back, everybody. Take pictures with them as well. Thank you, everyone. You have surveys, please fill them out. <laughs>